I got to talk a little bit about some things here before I get right into chapter 3 of Hebrews, but I saw yesterday that as I was recording or after I recorded that it didn't sync up really well with my voice and you know, my lips moving and so uh, it's kind of weird, but I had it on like 720p or something and <clears throat> so it was like 30 frames per second or something like that, so I knocked the quality down to like 480 now, which you can tell it's not as clear, but we'll see if the speed is right, and you know, maybe I can go from there. I'm just going to have to experiment with some things, and yesterday I added like an intro and an outro, and uh, just stuff that I had on my YouTube channel already that I could download. I'm wanting to make a lot more intros in the next couple weeks or so. I'm going to experiment, stuff like that. So I've got the video editor working, and I figured out, you know, I had to download a program called Handbrake, which converts video files, and I convert, uh, after I record a video like this, on the Logic Capture, Capture software, then I convert that video into an MP4, and then I put it into the video editor, and then I add whatever I want to, change, you know, the volume or anything. The volume something I'm going to have to work on, too, I don't know you know, it's too quiet or whatever, but at least I can edit that with the video editor too. Maybe I need to speak closer into the microphone. But, so I convert this video to an MP4, I put it in the movie editor, I add, change whatever I want to, and then I finalize that. Those can each take like 30 minutes or more, depending on how long the video is, it could take longer. Then, you know, finally I can upload the video, the final product, to YouTube. And actually, the final product uploaded faster than it would if I just recorded from the Logic Capture and then uploaded it. So I guess, you know, the, the video formats and stuff are, are smaller and quicker. And so, it does take a while to do all this, but it's not really that bad. So I think this is something I can get used to. But I'm just having fun experimenting, but I want to make the videos better quality. And It kind of stinks that this is a downgrade, but... Uh, you know, to take it from 720 to 480, but if it's synced up better, then maybe that's what's best for now. I'm just, I'm still going to have to experiment and just see what I can do. Uh, so, things, you know, aren't perfect when I upload them. And I'm working on making them better. We got Hebrews chapter 3. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So we learn some things about ourselves, and we learn some things about Jesus in this verse. You know, uh, the apostle Paul refers to you know the Jewish believers as holy brethren, and so you know we are seen as being holy because Christ is holy and we're in Christ and we are called to live holy lives and to be you know followers of Christ although you know in this in this world in this life you know we'll never be perfected but you know that goes against the whole carnal Christian doctrine like I was talking about before that some people will teach how they say that somebody can be saved and you know not you know, strive to live holy at all, or, or, you know, have no change in their life, and, uh, you know, it's not just holy, holy by name, you know, it's holy by, you know, who we're associated with, yes, I mean, that's a big part of it, but it's, it's, you know, it's kind of meaningless if, you know, you're not striving to live holy as well, and we're partakers of the heavenly calling, and, you know, he, he calls, uh, Jesus Christ, the Apostle and the High Priest of our faith, of our profession. Um, and again, you know, speaking to the Jews, referencing the Old Testament, uh, you know, stuff under the law, the High Priest. Um, and so, in verse 2, it says, Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So, I guess, uh, speaking of Jesus being faithful to the Father, serving the Father to the fullest, um, as Moses was faithful in all his house. And talking about Moses, you know, somebody who they 
highly uh, regarded, you know, and for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who builded the house hath more honor than the house. And so, uh, and, you know, it said that Moses was faithful in all his house, uh, I guess, you know, f among his brethren and stuff, you know, he served the Lord, uh, to a very high degree, and, you know, Jesus, you know, he says, uh, is worthy of more glory and honor, and, uh, so, you know, the people, the church, you know, the believers really belong to Christ, you know, they never belong to Moses, and, uh, you know, again, he's saying, you know, that Jesus is more than, you know, a prophet, um, or one of the patriarchs, he's, uh, you know, proclaiming his deity that God's people belong to him because he is God. He's the Son of God. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And so there, you know, talk about how Jesus is more worthy of more glory than Moses because he is the builder and then it basically says that he that built all things is God so that you put two and two together then Jesus Christ is God you know and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after but Christ as a son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Uh, so, talk about Christ being a son of God over his own house, whose house are, are we? If we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And so that's one of those, you know, if uh, people look at that and they say, that it's possible to lose your salvation. They can interpret a verse like that. Um, let me get this. Let me make a little more room over here. I'm wondering where, if we hold fast to confidence, and it references Matthew 10:22 here. But basically, I mean, it's not saying that, you know, you can begin to hold fast, you know, in the faith and then, you know, and be saved and then turn around and not be saved. But he's just saying that, uh, you know, basically those who are saved will hold fast to the faith uh, until the end. You know, until the end, that could be until the end of our life, you know, until, until our life ends, basically. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Uh, oops, this is the wrong one here. Zoom out. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do only err in their heart, and have they not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And so, I think this kind of this kind of continues with the idea of what he said in verse six about holding fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Then he quotes from the Old Testament what I just read, uh, 
looks like my Bible says from Psalm 95, verse 7. You know, from Psalm 95, basically, he's quoting. Uh, basically, I think that he's telling them, you know, or, you know, reminding them that they need to commit their life to Christ. Uh, and that's the only way. And, and that's opposed to them rejecting Christ as the Son of God. And he's saying, if you do that, then... Uh, then you will not take part in this. And so that's what he's, he's just reaffirming that you need to have faith in Christ. You need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. And so in verse 12 he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And so again, this people will take this as saying, well, you can believe in Christ and be saved, and then you can have a heart of unbelief and depart from your salvation. But really, uh, what he's saying is those who would, you know, in the first place not believe in Jesus Christ, the Jews who rejected Christ, they are the ones that have the heart of unbelief. And because of their rejection of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, they are departing from the living God. Okay, if they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. And that's basically, I think, what's being said here. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Um... <clears throat> I guess they all need to, uh, you know, remind each other and their, their brethren, uh, you know, the other Jews, the other Hebrews, that Christ is the only way, basically. And, uh, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but unto them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And so, I don't think it's talking about someone who believes with all their heart in Christ, they're born again, and then at some time down the line, they give up the faith, and, um, you know, they lose their salvation. He's talking about those, to begin with, uh, who reject Christ. Um, he's saying that, you know, those people won't take any part in this. The important matter here that's stressed over and over again is belief in Christ. And... Um, he uses the Old Testament reference of the story of Moses that um, you know, the people that fell in the wilderness they believe not. It was because of their lack of faith. And uh, so that's that. It's talking about you know your initial belief or unbelief making sure that they know that Jesus is God, he's the Son of God, he's the Christ, and he's making sure that they, and they know that they must believe that, and he's making sure that they know that, you know, the Old Testament was, was it was him that was spoken of all along by the prophets. And so that's that for chapter 3, so thanks for watching guys, I'll try to get chapter 4 done soon. God bless. Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. This is 
the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth, took, him, took on himself the nature of a man. He was crucified and died for our sins, and he rose again on the third day. To ask you the most important question of your life, your joy or sorrow for all eternity depends on your answer to this question. Are you saved? This has nothing to do with how good you are or if you go to a building called a church. But are you born again? In John chapter 3 verse 7, Jesus said, you must be born again. How can you be born again? First of all, you must realize that you are a sinner. Sin is anything in us that does not express or is contrary to the holy nature of our Creator, God. For instance, have you ever lied or cheated or stolen? These are all contrary to the character of God. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 when it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because you are a sinner, you are condemned to death. For the wages or the payment of sin is death. We read that in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. This includes eternal separation from God in hell. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. But God loved you so much he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to bear your sin and die in your place. He hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Jesus had to shed his blood and die, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Although we cannot understand how, God said, My sins and your sins were laid upon Jesus, and he died in our place. He became our substitute. It is true, God cannot lie. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, to repent means to turn around, to confess and forsake one's sins. It's a change of mind and a change of heart and a change of attitude that abhors sins. It agrees with God that one is a sinner and also agrees that Jesus died for us on the cross. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simply believe on him as the one who bore your sin, died in your place, was buried, and whom God resurrected. His resurrection powerfully assures that the believer can claim everlasting life when Jesus is received as Savior. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 13. Whosoever includes you shall be saved means not maybe nor can, but shall be saved. If you would like to learn more about sin, salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, or anything else concerning the Christian faith, please visit www.acceptgbconverted.com.